Hello, my name is Jamie Ayton. I'm the founder and executive director of the Humanitarian Disaster Institute here at Wheaton College. On behalf of HDI and the Billy Graham Center for Evangelism, we want to welcome you to the Disaster Justice Forum. So now before I get started, I have a very important question. How many people here are rooting for the Patriots on Sunday? Just show of hands. Okay, so I apologize in advance. I realize I'm going to be talking tonight with two things in my hands, and I talk with my hands a lot. So if one of these things start going waving, I'm going to avoid the Patriot fans, and I hope one of the Eagles will be able to catch the mic or whatever else I throw. Um, so um, just want to, again, uh, encourage you uh, to uh, join us on social media as well as to sign up for our weekly newsletter to be able to find out about more events like this, including our annual disaster ministry conference that will happen this June, as well as providing information on other opportunities for students, such as the breakaway opportunity that Wheaton College uh, students can participate in over spring break and to be able to deploy to Houston uh, and help with uh, Hurricane Harvey recovery there. So why are we here? When we look at in the book of Matthew, we see that as Christians, we're called to use our talents, our gifts, and our resources to help those in need. And when disasters strike, there is definitely need. The other reason why we're here tonight is to be able to raise awareness about injustices that exist in a community. When a disaster strikes, we see the media, the images, and we might feel compelled to help. And we wonder, how did people get in the situations that they're in? But many of the injustices that we see aren't just caused by the disaster, but rather that the disaster is putting a spotlight on the needs that have long existed within the community. You maybe have heard it said before that disasters don't discriminate. To a point, that's true. Disasters can affect anyone. But at the same time, it's the vulnerable who are most deeply affected when it hits. It's the poor, those who are living in poverty, that don't have resources, the medically uh, who are struggling. It's the vulnerable that are affected most. And so tonight, during our time together, that's what we're going to focus on, that we want to look at not just the disasters that we see on TV when something strikes, but also to look at the unnatural disasters, to look at issues like human trafficking, to look at the refugee crisis, to look at poverty, and then most importantly, to also look at how can the church respond. That if we here tonight truly want to pursue disaster justice, we must begin to do a better job of living out the teachings of Micah 6.8, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly. And beyond that, we must not only just respond to disasters, but we must begin as a church, as the full body of Christ, to respond to the injustices that lie beneath the disasters. So this evening, you'll be hearing from myself as well as several colleagues. You'll be hearing from Jenny Wong, who will be talking about issues of poverty and its connections to disasters and injustices. From Kent Annan, who will be highlighting issues like the refugee crisis, as well as drawing from his work in Haiti. And then finally, you'll hear from Ed Stetzer, who's going to be talking about how might the church respond when disaster strikes? How can we actually begin to help? And each of us are going to spend a few minutes sharing about these issues. And then afterwards, we're going to open it up for some question and answer time at the end. So I'm going to start by focusing on an unseen disaster. But first, I want to provide some context. Maybe you've thought to yourself in just the last couple of years, you know, it seems like disasters are happening more often. And, and if you've thought that, you're right. That there's been research that has shown that natural disasters in the last 20 years that there's been an increase. Now, not all of these are Hurricane Katrina level disasters. Some of them are smaller. Some of them it's because people are living in areas that maybe had been previously less populated. Some of the statistics are incredibly high because there's been increases in our ability to track disasters. But nonetheless, there's been a significant increase and they continue to get worse. On top of that, we see that disasters are becoming more complex in nature, that they're interconnected. Think about the Japan 311 tsunami well, it wasn't just the tsunami that hit. It actually started off with hundreds of small earthquakes that led to a larger one, that then led to the tsunami, that then led to a nuclear plant meltdown, that then led to a public health crisis. You see how these things are all interconnected. And it's not even just natural disasters that we're seeing increases in. If you look at the last 20 years, we also see an increase in things like terrorism, mass shootings, public health epidemics that are breaking out right now. And even in just the last year, 
Even think of it, just this past fall about the number of major hurricanes that struck. We have Irma, we have Harvey, right? That these all started to impact the United States. In fact, just a recent report that came out by FEMA shows in last year alone, nearly 8% of the US population was directly impacted by a disaster. Let, let that just sink in for a minute. Think about the entire global US, 8% of our country was affected by a disaster in some shape or form. Now, those images, when we talk about things like natural disasters or um, uh, terrorism, those are images that easily come to us. But one of the things we may not realize is that human trafficking is often, also often spikes in times of disasters. So presently, there's over 20 million people thought to be in slavery at this time. And for me personally, I wasn't really aware of the connection between disasters and human trafficking until our team at the Institute responded to the Haiti earthquake. When we were there, we were asked to come and work with a group of children that had been rescued out of very dire circumstances who were in Restivic. For those of you that may not be familiar with Restivic, it's actually a Haitian cultural practice of child servitude that sometimes takes on the form of child slavery. And after the earthquake, one of the things that we were informed about was that many children were actually promised a better life after the disaster and ended up being trafficked. And the one, there was this one girl that I met that I'll never forget. And she was probably about 12 years old. And she was sharing with us about her experience of being rescued out of trafficking after the earthquake. You see, she lost both of her parents and went to live with a relative. And the relative was promised by a group of men that if you send her with us, we promise to give her a better life in Port-au-Prince. So they send her off, and then she finds herself being the subject repeatedly of rape and molestation by the men in the home. She goes on to share with us while we're there that until she was rescued, she thought that she as a human was lower in term than the animals in the house because at least the animals got scraps from the table. She then goes on to tell these horrific stories of how one of the men that lived in the house had raped her on numerous accounts. She goes on to share about how she finally figured that she has to do something to protect herself. So in desperation, she decides to one night sneak out and try to sleep underneath the kitchen table. She surrounded herself with glass plates in hopes that if the man came, he would step on the plates and it would wake her up and hopefully she could escape. Her plan worked. He came, he stepped on the plates, it cut him, he yells. There was a woman neighbor next door who comes running into the house and helps free this young woman. Disasters, some of them, like the earthquake, are natural. Human trafficking is an unnatural event. And when we think of trafficking, we may think of stories like the one that I just shared. But it's not just children and women that are affected. Men can also be trafficked. And there's several um, high-profile cases just within the last decade that bring attention to this. This is actually a, a brief ad that was posted by a trafficking group, non-trafficking group, who was trying to raise awareness after Hurricane Harvey that in times of disasters, there's also labor trafficking. This is a picture of a group of men from India, actually about 500 in total, who were trafficked um, out of India. So they were promised by a group that if you come to the United States, we'll help you get a good job. We'll help you to have a better life. And so many of these men actually paid ten to $20,000 to this U.S. organization who promised them a, a new life here in the U.S. And then after they got here, they realized that even though they were brought here to help after Hurricane Katrina to Pascaloosa, Mississippi, that they were actually enslaved. That at night they were forced to live in a slum housing project and were actually um, kept into the homes at night by guarded men. And on top of this, they were forced by the people that brought them here to pay over $1,000 a month in housing to live in these slum armed guard conditions. Because they were told that if you make a scene, if you reach out to others for help, you're going to be deported and you may even be arrested or worse. These men were eventually uh, brought to freedom and won a major lawsuit against the company that had enslaved them. This next piece you'll see here is an ad that actually came from Texas out of Houston shortly after Hurricane Harvey. So the ad read, this was on an online 
uh, newspaper. Did Harvey displace you? Were you displaced by Harvey? Now looking to get it all back together? Are you a female under 40 and need a place to call it your home? Then this mature gentleman is ready to help you with a rent-free accommodation. If you are interested, then let's talk. Explain your situation, send a pic, and must use Harvey as a subject. We want to see that you are real. I am. Now, this ad in of itself doesn't prove trafficking occurred, but it highlights the way vulnerable are often taken advantage of in times of disaster. In fact, our team deployed shortly after Hurricane Harvey, just weeks after the event, to help provide spiritual and emotional care training there on the ground. And one of the things that we heard from many of the pastors that we were helping there was about how so many of the vulnerable were becoming even more vulnerable, that the disparities were getting even greater to those who had fewer things than those who had more as a result of the disaster. You see, when a disaster occurs, life doesn't just go back to normal. It actually takes more resources, more energy to get back even to where you were before the event. Further, on top of that, they shared stories of individuals that they were afraid that might be at risk for trafficking, particularly those from immigrant communities. So many of them were afraid of getting help from the federal government. They were afraid maybe we would be deported. And so the churches were going out and trying to reach out to many of these communities to help bring peace to them in their time of need. So overall, if you take only one thing from my talk, I hope that it's this. Disasters may reveal injustices in a community, but your response, the church's response, brings about God's grace and justice and mercy. Thank you. So next, I'd like to introduce Jenny Wong, who's our Managing Director at HDI. Jenny? Juggling going on here. Hi, everyone. Like Jamie just mentioned, I work as the Managing Director for the Humanitarian Disaster Institute. Um, my background is actually in international disaster psychology, which is a mouthful, always to say. Um, I worked primarily with refugees and um, worked with disaster survivors and trauma survivors. So, without further ado, I'm gonna speak a little bit, but this is obviously a very complex subject to try to talk to in 10 minutes. So I'm gonna give a brief overview of how disasters and poverty intersect. So, Jamie just touched upon human trafficking. And human trafficking occurs when there's inequality and justice in society. And to reiterate, disasters may not discriminate. Um, they may not discriminate who will impact, but it does exacerbate, it accentuates and unveil the societies that do. And as Jamie mentioned, disasters dis disproportionately impacts the poor and under-resourced. We can see it on a nationwide level, and we can see it on a community level, and we can see it on a city level. The geography of inequality expresses itself in all scales, between regions and countries, and between countries into, and between countries into cities and localities. So, on a country level, we can compare three different earthquakes that had a magnitude over six. So we had uh, the 2008 earthquake in China. We had the earthquake in Italy um, in 2009 and the um, 2010 Haiti earthquake that many of you were very familiar with. And if we look down here, we see a stark difference in death tolls. And we see at Haiti, 230,000. And even taking consideration the technicalities of the disaster zone. So for instance, China, uh, the earthquake hit in, um, it hit several bigger towns. In Italy, it hit small towns, and in Haiti, it hit a big, a major city, it hit Port-au-Prince. So, but even taking that into consideration of the, dense, the dense, density of the population, the stark difference in death tolls, that's, it's, it's huge. So then we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? So prior to the earthquake, 72% of the population lived on less than $2 a day. And 
it became obvious that it wasn't just the density of where it hid. It, it was the fact that people living in that city, they were living in poor, densely packed shanty houses, badly constructed buildings. And Haiti had less governance of ensuring building, uh, of building codes. And on top of that, there was corruption in building inspections. And despite that $13 billion went into Haiti, only a fraction of it actually was, was used in recovery effort. And there was no accountability um, with the people that were coming in to, uh, as for humanitarian aid groups and workers coming in, there was lack of coordination and the cholera outbreak eventually caused further devastation. And even till this day, 300,000 people still live in camps. It's not just the, on, a on a nationwide level. Um, we saw it in the United States for Hurricane Katrina, how disasters disproportionately impacted in, uh, in, in poor communities. New Orleans, prior to Hurricane Katrina, 28% of the population was considered poor, and of which 70% were African American. The images that outpoured from New Orleans was, was of primarily African Americans' cries of desperation. And it became an illuminating example of how disasters disproportionately fell on low-income communities of color. So one of, one of the key conferences I actually went to last year was one on urban flooding in Chicago. It's even in our backyards, in the city of Chicago, flood prone areas are more likely to be inhabited by lower socioeconomic status people due to cheaper housing costs. And to make matters worse, they are less likely to invest in risk, redu risk reducing measures. And many can't afford to move out of these communities and they can't afford to invest in risk, risk reduction. It impacts their health, their education, and opportunities, and the poverty cycle ensues. Disasters not, do not only disproportionately impact the poor and heighten inequality, they also are underreported from poorer countries and communities and neighborhoods. So for instance, Care International, they did a report on the most underreported crisis of 2016. And if you look at these countries here, out of, the, I think it's about 12, majority of these countries actually of that same year were, were reported as one of the poorest countries in the world. So there, it's not a coincidence. Disasters also show the presence of past structural injustice. So this is of uh, after Hurricane Irma and Hurricane, um, Hurricane Maria. After Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria, it wasn't just poverty that plagued recovery. It was the compounded history of colonial neglect and the process of economic conversion into tax havens that catapulted Puerto Rico specifically into a further humanitarian crisis. Pursuing justice in the wake of disaster means understanding the injustices that disasters accentuates and unveils. It means understanding poverty. It means understanding the difference between good infrastructure and poor infrastructure. It means understanding policy. It means making, and this is a terminology, I went to a Jesuit school, so we always said making a preferential option for the poor. But it also means knowing who the poor are. <coughs> Disasters are disturbances that unveil the very worst and the very best of humanity. So the reason why I have this picture up here is that this reminds me so I, I, I just spoke, I just went through a pl plethora of the very worst of society, of how, we can, of how disasters can unveil those injustices. But I do want to leave on a, a, a note of what very best can look like. And 
recently, um, with the Humanitarian Disaster Institute, we went to Kakuma, uh, to Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. And we, as an institute, work with the refugee churches there, and they are a group um, called the United Host Churches, the refugee churches. And they established, they themselves are, are refugees. They're, they're pastors um, that have fled war, fled they have fled disasters themselves, and they're living it again in these camps where it's, they experience extreme heat and violence and hunger. But even in the midst of all that, they were able to establish KISM, which is, stands for Kakuma Interdenominational School of Mission. They, they came together as refugee pastors and, and created a school, created a school for other refugees can be trained to serve others. Um, and they don't, they, they don't only train refugees, they train the host community members as well, the Turkana people of Kenya. And when, I, when we were there in the camp, for me, this was the very best of humanity. This, this showed me that within, even within poverty, what justice looks like, what it can be. So my question is, as Christians, as people who believe in justice as an extension of our faith, what more can we do? And what can we do? Doesn't, we don't necessarily have to be in refugee camps to pursue justice. Um, what can we do in our, in our lives here, in our churches here? And that being said, I'm actually gonna hand off to Kent, <laughs> who's a senior fellow here. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Hello, thank you everybody so much for coming out uh, this evening to look at a, such an important topic. Um, for me, Jenny was just talking about this refugee camp. And for me, refugees have really uh, changed the shape and direction of my life. When I had first, and some of your college students here, uh, right after I graduated from college, I moved to Europe and worked with the refugee ministry for two years. At that time, people were coming from uh, Sierra Leone, where there was a conflict, from the former Yugoslavia that was breaking up in war. And refugees then ceased being just headlines or a, a topic for me, but they were friends and people I lived in a hostel with and people who beat me in ping pong and chess regularly. And, uh, and that changed the direction of my life to where I've worked in the humanitarian um, realm for the last 25 years. Uh, after that, I came back and went to graduate school and went to seminary. The day after I graduated from seminary, I moved to Albania, to northern Albania, because there was a war in Kosovo at the time and worked with refugee response there for four months in northern, Uganda, uh, northern uh, Albania and then went into Kosovo when the war ended and the border opened up. And again, it was a life-shaping experience to get to work with people there and help to respond to these crises, the kind of disasters we've been talking about. Came back and married and two years later, my wife and I got on a plane and 24 hours later, we were living in a little village outside uh, of Port-au-Prince a uh, village in Haiti with a subsistence farming family and no, no running water, no electricity, a little tin-roofed house. And we had one room in this house with this subsistence farming family. And we lived with them for seven months. And they didn't speak any English. And we didn't speak any Creole. And we learned the language because we were committed to working for the long term in this humanitarian way to serve. And so we lived there for two and a half years in Haiti and then moved back to the US and I've been going back and forth to Haiti now for the last 12 years working on long-term humanitarian development and education with churches and schools. Uh, the earthquake that, that Jenny mentioned happened along the way so the humanitarian as Jamie framed as well the humanitarian work and the disaster work are so closely entwined and that's part of why we've we're doing this work that we're doing in uh, HDI and in the Institute and the new master's program and I wanted to share with you one story I had that shaped how I've worked with refugees and the kind of humanitarian work I've had when I was in Haiti. Now, there was a disaster nearby, one of these kind of mid-level disasters, and a tropical storm came near, and rains came down and flooded this city of Gonaive, and about a thousand people died. 
we were doing human we were doing more you know educational work so unfortunately we didn't have the resources to respond and this city was totally flooded and and aid couldn't get in because of limited resources and people couldn't get out it was really a crisis and we we had to just keep doing our educational work so I went with some Haitian colleagues and we did a seminar nearby finished the seminar and went out to the side of the road to catch some public transportation and a truck came by it was probably a bread delivery truck or something in a previous life here and they put a couple thin wood benches down either side and a couple like subway railings on the roof and uh, I piled in, I was the only American, I piled in with uh, 60 of my new Haitian best friends and you crowd in together and if you move your ankle too much in one direction, the chicken lets you know that that's her territory uh, and to, to not move at all. And so we start bouncing along from the city of Gonaive with a few hours back to Port-au-Prince. As we're going along, you know, nobody had smartphones so people are talking with each other and uh, as conversations happening, we start talking, everyone starts talking about Go Naive, this city that's nearby under this flood and the tragedy that's happened. And as people are talking about it, suddenly this one young man, probably just a little older than some of you in his early 20s, uh, he's standing in the middle, he's holding the rail, and he says, I'm from Go Naive. I just got out. And the whole front half of the truck where I was sitting, everyone went silent because people weren't getting in or out of Go Naive at that time. And so people started asking him questions, you know, well, what's it like, what's going on? And he started, you know, telling stories and talked about the water coming in to sweep the living away to join the dead. And he talked about scrambling to his roof and he talked about his mom and his sisters who he'd left there on the roof so that he could get out to try to get some supplies. And he must have slogged through miles of, of muck and water and mud to get out. So he's talking about this, and as he keeps telling the story and people are asking him questions, he looks down at his clothes, he said, look, the, clothes, the only clothes I have, the clothes I'm wearing, those are the clothes I have had on when the flood came, and that was a week ago. And we look and can tell he's filthy, and as he keeps talking, and now bear in mind the 60 people on this truck bouncing towards Port-au-Prince, most of them in Haiti, about 80% of people are living on less than $2 a day, so living on the edge of survival themselves. For bouncing towards Port-au-Prince. He says that about his clothes and keeps talking and, and then a, a man sitting across the way reaches into his bag and pulls out a t-shirt and hands it to this man. And he takes in some of these market women who've been all day in the hot sun selling things from their garden to, to make a couple dollars to try to support their families. These women say, take off your old shirt, put the new one on, put the new one on. And so he he, as we keep moving along, he takes off his old shirt and puts a new shirt on. We keep bouncing along, and as he's putting that on, another man reaches into his bag and takes out a pair of shorts. And a woman reaches in and pulls out a brush, and someone else reaches in to her bag and pulls out a pair of flip-flops. As that's happening, one of these market women stands up as we're still driving along and reaches into the fold of her her skirt where people, women would often keep their money and she takes out I think maybe a 50 good note, a, a dollar and a half, maybe most of what she earned to support her family that day. And she puts it in her hand and then she starts squeezing around the bus around the back of the truck from person to person saying, just give what you can, give five goods, 10 goods, 50 goods, just give what you can to help. And she squeezes around and I see almost every single person on that truck give money to help this man, people who had almost nothing giving to this man who had nothing. And I felt like the ground and that rickety truck turned holy, like I was in the temple with Jesus who was pointing out the widow who was taking two coins, everything she had, and giving in the offering, giving everything she had to God. She squeezes back around and she has this fistful of coins and bills now and puts it into the man's hand and says, here, this is for you. And he puts it into his pocket and then he starts to cry as he's holding on and then he starts to weep. And these women say, no, no, don't cry, don't cry. We're all go naiveans now. We just wish we had more to give, but we're all go naiveans now. And friends, I think we're all people of God's kingdom now. When we think of a world with disasters like this, this means we 
get to, we have to, and we get to respond with our very best. This past year, I've been working on a book about refugees. It's called You Welcomed Me, Echoing Jesus in Matthew 25. You welcomed me, loving refugees and immigrants, because God first loved us. We have a disaster now, and these disasters that are causing 65 million people to be displaced around the world from their homes, and 22 million of them have had to leave the borders of their countries, so they're refugees. So I've worked on this book. I visited places all over the US, and I went to um, Jordan, and I sat in the living room in Mafrak, Jordan. Mafrak is a city of 60,000 people that now has 160,000 people because 100,000 Syrians have become part of that city. 100,000 Syrians have joined that one town of 60,000, which is probably about three times as many people as our country will receive of refugees in the next three years at the current rate that's been set. So in this city, I sat in the living room and, and listened to this woman tell about escaping and bombs and carrying her child when she thought a sniper would hit her and escaping to the border, getting into Syria, being helped by others, and now she's working with World Relief to teach parenting classes to help other refugees do their best. She's giving her two coins by helping other refugees, not just being someone who receives help. I was in northern Uganda this past year as well, and I met a man named Dominique. Dominique was a refugee. He walked from South Sudan, like a million other people from South Sudan. He escaped, walking four days with his wife and three children. He gets to this refugee camp, and people asked him and said, well, there are these three orphans. They're not people, he, not kids he knew before, not from his tribe and he accepted three orphans. So now he's trying to care for his three kids and he's fostering three orphans there in Camp Beatty Beatty with 287,000 other people. And Dominique is giving his two coins, everything he has to care for people. And we have that chance, I think we have that call to give everything we have. And as we do that, there are ways to do it by research and the kind of research that Jamie and and the team at the Humanitarian Disaster Institute, what we're doing to do the best research to think, well, part of how we can give our two coins is to do research to know how do we best respond in these moments to care for people psychologically and spiritually. And do research to think, well, what's the best response we can give so that we can, where Dominique, Dominique is in northern Uganda, in one way it's horrific, like Jenny said, the worst of humanity, but it's also in one way this beautiful thing because in this isolated part of northern Uganda, they're getting food, basics of food, and they're getting water. And Dominique is actually HIV positive and he goes to a clinic and gets medicine every day. Some of the best comes out in this humanitarian work in response to disasters. And I think what we can do as we give our two coins and what we're doing as we launch this new, new master's degree in humanitarian and disaster leadership is to say, well, if you want to give your two coins by giving your vocation to serving people in these circumstances, then we want to help you do that so that you're prepared to give your two coins, give your vocation in the very best way. But whatever your call in church, in vocation, in giving, in praying, in taking this on as vocation. It's a terrible responsibility in one way to see so many people in disaster. But another way, what a beautiful opportunity to get to respond by doing justice and by loving kindness and by walking humbly with God to serve our neighbors. Amen. I'm grateful to hand it off to Ed Stetzer. <laughs> well, good evening, everybody. My name is Ed Stetzer. I lead the Billy Graham Center here on campus. And thank you for, for Jenny and Jamie and, of course, for Kent as well. Appreciate that so much. And Jenny mentioned uh, the best and worst. And we're going to talk some about these moments, the best and worst, sometimes the disasters uh, bring out in us. My own background involves I formerly worked at the third largest disaster relief agency 
uh, in the U.S. We, uh, and behind the Red Cross and the Salvation Army, it's called the North American Mission Board. It's probably one you haven't heard of, but it was substantially involved in disaster relief there. And now have the privilege of serving as a senior fellow with the Humanitarian Disaster Institute. And I want to talk a little bit about kind of three framing ways to discuss some of these, these ideas of why we should do disaster ministry. You may have noticed that each of us had a little bit of a different assignment. Mine is about the church being engaged and why the church should be engaged and involved in those things. And so I want to talk about three reasons we might do so and then share some research that might help explain that. The first is the biblical reason, and we do see the Bible's clear teaching over and over again about people ministering to people who are in crisis. Matter of fact, Jesus would frequently mention even as the gospel would be shared. For example, we look at Luke 4, 18 through 20. Jesus says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news, but then he talks about the, the poor. He talks about, the, uh, he talks about the, the blind and the marginalized. And, and many of those are individual crises, and we're not specifically focusing on here today the, the crisis, for example, of deep, extreme global poverty. But we're looking at how disasters relate in the midst of that and how we as followers of Jesus might engage in that disaster ministry. Why does that matter? Well, one of the realities is, is that faith-based organizations are actually the largest provider of immediate disaster relief and recovery as well. And so what will happen is, is that a disaster will come. Perhaps some of us might be familiar with a Hurricane Harvey, for example, or others. And, and of course, the, the government FEMA responds, and how FEMA responds becomes an issue of great news debate because the, the, the president at that time will be rated well or poorly based upon how FEMA does. But what often gets missed in some of that political discussion is it's only a matter of weeks before the minority of work is done by FEMA and government agencies and the majority of work is done by faith-based organizations. And so in doing so, I wrote an article a few weeks ago, I guess it was a few months ago now, in USA Today, sort of pointing out the work of those faith-based institutions there. It was last year I was in Budapest at a church called Golgotha uh, and Calvary, if you will. It's a Calvary chapel. It's the largest church uh, in the country now in Budapest, and what they became known for was, many of you are familiar, but it became a, a literal highway of refugees that walked right past their church. It was quite controversial. Hungary's not a friendly place towards refugees, and so they knew that in the midst of the Bible's teaching and the, 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 the example of Jesus and the call of the Christian is to actually care for the most vulnerable and and those who are hurting. So, for example, we've heard talk about sexual trafficking that Jamie mentioned was related to such. Their ministry get much higher engagement in and around issues of sexual trafficking. Why? Because in the midst of the refugee crisis, they knew that the most marginalized would be further marginalized and taken advantage of as well. They get involved in serving and ministering. And I want you to know that it wasn't always received well by even people in their, in their own church. I didn't notice when I came in, but I see several of you from Moody Church here today. And, you know, the first time, I'm now the interim teaching pastor for several folks here uh, at Moody Church. But the first time I spoke at Moody Church was at the missions conference two years ago when they asked me to speak about refugees and how we might engage in these issues. That wasn't always a popular subject, is ministering among refugees. But churches have recognized that this crisis is a place where, where they need to be. Now, why would that be? Well, I mean, think, think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? We think of the parable of the Good Samaritan, and we know even today there are Good Samaritan laws. So if you ever pull over and try to help somebody on the side of the road and you accidentally make it worse, uh, you actually won't, you won't get in trouble. That's, that's what we think of as Good Samaritan laws. And, but actually, in Luke chapter 10, the story of the Good Samaritan is in the midst of a personal disaster. And this uh, traveler is robbed and, and beaten and stripped and left on the side of the road. But, but then a, a priest comes by and ignores him, and a Levite comes by and ignores him. And it's actually a, a good Samaritan. And by the way, the phrase good and Samaritan would not generally be found in a sentence together for the people to whom Jesus spoke. And so the reality is, is we now ourselves are called to be those who minister in the midst of what was a personal crisis in the traveler and the side of the road, but now is often a global crisis and, and more. Now, why does that matter? Well, Matthew 5, 16, Jesus reminds us that they'll see our good works and give glory to our Father in heaven. So I do believe that uh, one of the great moments of when I served at this mission agency, the North American Mission Board is affiliated with my denomination, which is Southern Baptist. And Southern Baptists are predominantly rural and predominantly white, not, not exclusively in either category. But Hurricane Katrina struck in uh, New Orleans and predominantly urban and uh, predominantly African-American. And I was at, my job was to actually geocode the locations of the disaster 
units as they lined up. And so I remember standing in the, in the Day Auditorium, the Cecil B. Day, the Days Inns, gave his money to build this. And, and I remember standing there, and, and my job, I had geocoded all the units ready to go in and to serve. And I knew where they were coming from, rural Alabama and rural Mississippi and northern Louisiana, which was rural. And I knew they were primarily going to be white and rural. And I knew that it would be a fascinating thing to watch literally hundreds of thousands of rednecks with chainsaws going into the city of New Orleans. Can I just tell you, it was a great learning experience for them. It was a great opportunity to serve others who may, they might not have come into contact with. And might I also add, it was a great opportunity to be known for something other than sometimes the negative attributes that come with what Christians, and perhaps in the case of Southern Baptists, are known for. And so one of the great moments, I actually have written before that that was the, the most important moment that I think I served at the North American Mission Board was at that moment. So it's a biblical call. It's also an historic thing we don't want to forget. The church has thrived in moments of crisis. And, and, and mind you, crisis has often been a tough time sometimes and, a, and an opportunity for the church to step up at others. And, and disasters, I mean, these are major markers in the life of the church. The Great Lisbon Earthquake became a, a major struggle in the life of the church and its theology. But, but if you look back and look at Rodney Stark's book, Cities of God, how Christianity became an urban religion and conquered Rome, what you find is, is, and he's right, that the early church didn't explode like some people think. It's a bit of a myth that there was, for example, widespread persecution in the first century, but explosive growth, and really neither took place. There was widespread persecution and explosive growth later, but a lot of that took place in the late second and early third century. You know when? In the middle of a disaster. See, a plague swept through the empire, and, and people don't respond well to plagues, neither then nor, nor do they now. Uh, when we saw, for example, the Ebola crisis, and how Americans made a crisis in Africa ultimately about them because they were so concerned about a hospital in Dallas and a hospital in Atlanta that this was going to wipe us all out, when really it was a crisis in Africa, but it became about us. But during this time, the plague, the, the Christians actually, well, they, they jumped in and they, they began to serve and they began to minister to others. And, and the great growth of the church actually came later on in the late second and early third century in large measure because of how the Christians responded. Matter of fact, there was an emperor named Julian. He's called Julian the Apostate. You can tell history is written by people who didn't like him. Uh, but Julian the Apostate actually wrote this once. He talked about these Christians, and he said they were these impious Galileans. That was his words, these impious Galileans. That's what they called the Christians. They cared not only for their own sick and dead, but for ours also. And people saw, can I tell you too, that People in New Orleans saw how people came and ministered alongside and showed and shared the love of Jesus there. People in the second and third century saw how people showed and shared the love of Jesus there. I've always been um, aware and concerned about some of these things. I know I've driven my, my daughters crazy because we sometimes will go to the Florida Keys, and I always want to stop at this one monument where the Labor Day hurricane of 1935 uh, destroyed a veteran's camp and, and killed uh, hundreds. But I but I, but I know when we look at these moments, that these are moments of great, great pain. There you can go at Isla Morada, mile marker 82, if you've never been there. Um, you can stop and see a great pain, but also times when the people of God stepped up. Now, why does that matter? Well, I wrote in this USA Today article and uh, some wisdom from Mr. Rogers. Now, I know not all of you have lived in a time when you remember uh, Mr. Rogers, but Mr. Rogers was asked once, what did he tell children in the midst of disasters, how they should respond. And he said to them this, he said, look for the helpers. And I wrote in that article, look for the helpers. What you find is those helpers are actually so often driven by a biblical desire for sharing and showing the love of Jesus. And historically, it's made such a difference in the life of the church. But that's not all. Um, let me also mention there's a missional lens here, right? Uh, Jesus always sends us, but even more so to the marginalized. Jenny actually quoted a, a famous line, of, uh, phrase about the preferential option for the poor. But we see the poor and the marginalized so frequently mentioned in the ministry of Jesus. And sometimes we forget that indeed the poor and the marginalized are sometimes the greatest victims. I, I know I, I preach once a month at a church in Miami called Christ Fellowship. And Christ Fellowship is a, it's a wonderful church. It's predominantly Cuban. It's, uh, we have a bunch of different campuses. Um, and we had, uh, there were some, this is a very busy hurricane season. Hurricane Irma was forecasted to hit where we were. And we had campuses all over. We have a campus downtown. Uh, we have a campus in Coral Gables, which is an affluent area. Downtown is a poor area. But you know what we saw very quickly? Can I just tell you, the, the, the affluent, the middle class, just drove up the coast and found a hotel. Uh, the poor couldn't and didn't and had to hunker down and 
needed that additional engagement in ministry and resource. Well, we know that in moments like this, the refugee crisis, the, the largest, because we don't have the full, full documentation during seasons like World War II, but the largest historical refugee crisis, well, we've, we've, we've ever had, we've ever seen. And so I love the fact that Moody Church mobilized in the midst of that, asked me specifically to address that. I love the fact that the church is still engaging and caring in the midst of some of this brokenness. Why? Well, because these things have real consequences. We saw after Irma came another hurricane called Maria, which has still left so many without power. And if you've ever walked the streets of Puerto Rico and walked around in the communities, what you find is, well, the brokenness remains, and it's the most margin the marginalized and the poor who are the most impacted. Now, our church is getting engaged and involved. Sure, they are. We actually asked at a Lifeway research study. I was uh, I was running Lifeway research at the time, and. Uh, and we asked, what are some things, which, if any, of the following areas of service have you heard local Christian churches or their members doing the last six months? So we actually asked among Americans. And what we actually see now is now disaster victims, helping disaster victims, is becoming a, a, a more and more common awareness. And part of what I want to do is remind people of that. I want to remind people who maybe are not as enthusiastic about people of faith, but then I want to remind people of faith that we can be involved at even a greater level and a greater engagement. Um, the, we also asked the question, uh, how people felt, how people respond. How do you feel about God when suffering occurs that appears unfair? Well, some trust God more. Uh, some are confused about God, and I don't think about God in these situations or none of these. I wonder if God cares. I, I doubt God exists. I'm angry towards God. Can I just tell you that in the midst of these disasters, there's a, there's a torrent of emotions. Some of them are conflicting. Some of them are unsure. And you know, I've, I've looked in the whole Bible, and I still don't get the answer as to why disasters come. Uh, but when I look also to the Bible and to the teachings of Scripture and the history of how the church has lived this out, I, I don't see that God gives us the answers, but I do see he consistently promises his presence and gives of himself. And so as we as followers of Jesus will join Jesus on mission, he says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, we'll ultimately engage in something that's, that's, that's biblical. It's a clear teaching of ministry in crisis. Historical, the church has thrived in moments of crisis, and ultimately it's missional. Jesus always sends us out, but more so to the marginalized. It gives us the opportunity to show and share the love of Jesus to a broken and hurting world. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you. I'll turn it back over to Jamie. So now what we want to do is to open it up for questions um, that folks might have and have a bit of discussion. And I wanted to take just a moment and introduce our colleague, Laura Leonard, who's our communication specialist here at HDI that will be help facilitating this conversation. Hi, thanks for coming. Um, so now that you've heard all four of our speakers, we invite you to bring your questions. Um, our preference would be if you could come down here to the microphone. We just have the one, so if you could ask your question and line up here, and then we can hand the microphone off to our speakers. Um, if you can't come down here, you can just wave your hand and I can come up to you and we'll figure it out. So don't let that be a hindrance. But yeah, we would love to hear uh, any questions you have. While you're thinking about it and maybe coming down here uh, to form a line, I'll get us started. Um, so we, we heard from all of you about a lot of different areas. I'm just wondering if you could maybe um, highlight one practical thing someone could do walking away from here tonight to start engaging these issues in their everyday life. You know, I think when it comes to responding to disasters, one of the most practical things that we can do is to help with humility. That oftentimes when a disaster strikes, I think sometimes we think we know the best way to help. But instead we need to look to the local communities, to their knowledge and to their needs to find out how to help. You know, something that really stands out to me um, was after Hurricane Katrina, I remember there was this church uh, somewhere up north that raised $60,000 to collect a number of uh, frozen microwave meals that they put on a semi that they had rented and hired a driver to drive all the way down to Mississippi to deliver these meals. So the driver shows up, but can anybody maybe hear a problem with the type of aid they provided? There, there was no electricity, so you, you couldn't store the food to keep it cold, and you also couldn't cook the food anyways. So they thought they knew the best way instead of looking to the local community, so help with humility. You know, one of the things I, that I mentioned briefly is that um, you learn from those uh, among whom you serve. And as, uh, as my own denomination sort of engaged in New Orleans, and of course Katrina is much more than that. You, were, you did your research, I think, in Mississippi, right? Is that where you were? Yeah. And uh, I think ultimately that became, kind of adding to what you're saying, became a learning experience that maybe people they hadn't 
uh, had normally run into contact with, they, they were able to learn and grow and build relationships that lasted. I think that's a good thing. I would say one practical thing you can do is almost all of the churches that you go to would have some sort of either con- local disaster relief uh, plan or some connection denominationally with someone that you can get that training. So I would encourage you to get that training and become what my denomination we call a yellow hat so you can actually get the training and be part of it because those, uh, you know, we talked about spontaneous unaffiliated volunteers, those SUVs um, aren't always so helpful and uh, can cause more difficulty than they cause help. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, My question is somewhat along those lines, I'm really interested in kind of the economic relief that comes along with, you know, post-disaster response. But one of my questions is involved with what are some of the preconceived notions that we as responders need to be rid of? I think that in you know, in your typical evangelical um, wealthy church, you see a lot of people who are concerned with where their money is going, where the resources are going, and some of that's merited, some of it's not. What do you think are some mentality shifts that need to happen in the church? Great question. Thanks. I think that's the question is sort of reflecting the kind of humility that we talked about. It like so, plugging in with experts, and then my brother-in-law and some of you. There was a I cover article in Christianity Today in December about uh, cash transfers. So this is one of the new things post disaster that I think is helpful and sort of a, takes a mind shift. Um, my brother-in-law is a professor at University of Chicago, and he's led the way and done cutting edge research on how giving cash to people in humanitarian disasters and even long-term situations is a very effective way to help. And so uh, I think that's sort of an counterintuitive where people think, oh, it doesn't work, but actually getting cash to people as fast as possible is is really effective in disasters. I've been in different disaster areas in northern Albania and Haiti after the earthquake, and you go down the road and you see all, you know, people who got they have like a red cross on them. They got a, a gallon of oil to cook rice, but they're now selling the oil in the market to try to get what they actually need. And so it becomes an inefficient market instead of the most efficient market possible. So I think that's an interesting mind shift in some of the big like International Rescue Committee. My sister works for them and they're re- leading their research and they're sort of working to get into a disaster area and get cash to people as fast as possible so they can get what they need and so that the market can kind of help fill in uh, as efficiently as possible. So that's one example of something that's interesting where I think the kind of research that HDI and others are doing is really important to take on uh, preconceived notions and find, well, how do we love our neighbors in the very best ways possible? I think, especially if you're responding to somewhere that's um, a developing country, for instance, one, I feel a lot of people forget power dynamics um, when you are a person that is offering uh, resources of basic needs where you are in a position of. And so I think that's always, that's something to be always uh, considerate of, just knowing that in the back of your head that when you are offering basic needs to someone who is stripped of everything, where, uh, where your position is. And I th- so that would be my two cents. I think when we give, we also need to make sure that we are giving to meet the needs of those who've been impacted and not our own needs. Um, you know, for me, one of the most horrific disasters I could even imagine was the Sandy Hook mass shooting that happened and the loss of, of child, the children's lives there and teachers uh, that were impacted and can't even imagine and get my head around that. But afterwards, um, a lot of people, when they saw it, instead of giving financially, a number of people uh, were actually giving teddy bears, which on, on a level, as, so I'm a father of three. You know, I, I know that giving a gift like that can make a difference for a child going through a trauma. But it, there were so many bears that came. The, one of the local officials had to come out and say, please stop giving them. We are spending thousands of dollars. We're having to get a warehouse. We're having to get people to work to take care of these teddy bears instead of the people who are actually affected. And not only that, another example, there was someone who had learned of a child who um, uh, that went through that experience and who had loved horses. And somebody really felt that deeply and gave, a, like, actually loaded up and sent a horse to that community. Now, again, that person was trying to help, but instead just took away resources, kind of like what Kent and Jenny both mentioned. I 
guess we're all just, I'll just say, don't make it about you. It's not about you. It's about them. And ultimately, learning, serving, encouraging, uh, meeting immediate needs, and then moving on immediate needs. So. Two questions, actually, one of mine and one from a friend. Um, my question is, um, does this degree, specifically the master's degree, does it um, focus more on a sort of short-term immediate relief from disasters, or does it focus more on um, equipping people to change systemic problems that are creating um, situations in which disasters are going to impact people even worse? Um, and then, should I... Um, one of the benefits of Christian disaster aid is the holistic approach that not only involves material reconciliation, but personal, relational, and spiritual. Do you think your institution fits into this holistic model, and in what ways? The program. You, got yeah. <laughs> you want to answer the program question? You want the guy answer <laughs> so, in terms of the way our program is structured, uh, the answer would be yes. So, um, you had asked, does it help to prepare students uh, to be able to respond to the immediate needs? Yes. Does it help students to prepare them to deal with the long-term recovery issues? Yes. And on top of that, we're also interested in development. So for us, we really want to actually even extend beyond that to also, how can we even start to help communities prepare for disaster. So we're really looking at that full life cycle. You know, in fact, again, you know, if you just even look at the way in the title of our program, that it's, it's not just about disasters, that we recognize that it's happening within a larger context. So, you know, one example of a course that focuses on the immediate is how to organize a humanitarian response, or we're going to be having a field ops course where we actually run people through live disaster and crisis simulations. But at the same time, we're also offering, offering courses like transformational development uh, to really be able to deal with not just the emergency, but how do we get at some of these systemic justice issues? And because that my short-term memory is not the greatest, I'll let somebody else answer the second question. Kent is ready. <laughs> I'll just add to that first question as well and say it's part of, I think, the, the team that we're assembling in this program, like for those of us teaching and pulling the program together, it has a range of, of both uh, disaster expertise, like Jamie and I've done long-term development and it also has the research side as well as the very practical side so um, so we really see that they're so interlinked that you're going to be prepared if you go into one or the other or into a kind of region where both are addressed by knowing all of that uh, holistic approach is going to serve you well in your vocation uh, wherever you go in that um, because they they inform each other so much uh, and then the second question is related to that I think the holistic response is exactly what we want to be is forming uh, students who come into the program as leaders, as humble leaders who are following Christ. And then secondly, learning uh, rigorous theological thought and the best approaches of why we do this as Christians. And then the last part is to be evidence-based in our approaches and using the very best cutting-edge practices to serve people. So we really see that holistic um, response as a necessary part of what the Institute, I mean, it's the very mission of the Institute, which also carries over into being the mission of the master's program. Um, thank you all for coming and speaking to us. Um, I think one theme that I saw across all of your speeches was just how much the marginalized are affected by disasters, regardless of who was hit. Um, and oftentimes, that's the poor and that's people of color. Um, and so one thing also that I'm really grateful for that um, Ms. Huang brought up was the power dynamics that are involved in that. Um, and so I'm really intrigued seeing that three out of the four of you are white men um, like interested in this issue. So um, I just want to hear from, especially from the white men, but you as well, Ms. Wong, if you wouldn't mind, um, just sharing how your race has played a role in this and like maybe just like some of the paradigm shifts that you've had to go through or some of the, um, just, just like how that awareness has had to come with this. Um, yeah, just kind of, what those dynamics have looked like and whether you've ever seen that as being an obstacle to your work. You know, I think when we think about humanitarian and disaster response, at its very core, it's relational. 
Um, one of my first experiences with disasters was the fact that I'd actually just moved into South Mississippi six days before Hurricane Katrina struck my community. And within uh, weeks, I was working to do research there and work with local churches. And one of the things that I noticed uh, in particular was uh, a lot of the mental health centers were operating well above capacity. Yet I, I noticed very few minorities from the communities were seeking mental health care. So I started asking questions of where's, where's everyone going? And, and so in particular, I started reaching out and working with the African American community after Katrina. And um, we were doing this research project to try to understand uh, what needs were and, and how to connect mental health and the African American church together to respond. And I'll never forget going to talk to this one pastor, and I show up to his church, and uh, he invites me in, and I'm getting ready to do a, a research interview, so I think. And he starts off by saying, welcome, and then goes on to say, I just want to let you know I don't do interviews because I don't trust what people quote me with. And then he goes on, and the other thing is that you realize you're more than the trifecta of suspicion, don't you? And so I kind of pause, and I ask, what do you mean? And he goes, well, you know, you're, you're white. You're a psychologist, and from the funny way that you talk, you're a northerner, you're a Yankee. <laughs> and I thought, oh, well, this is going to go really well. So he goes on and says, you know, so let's, uh, I guess, connect, shall we? And what we ended up doing was we spent almost a full hour just talking and, and just getting to know each other. And after about an hour, I'm thinking, oh, this is going nowhere. All of a sudden he says, all right, go ahead, shoot away, ask what you want. And so I start going through my protocol and asking him questions. And afterwards, he stops and he looks at me and he's like, all right, who else do you want to talk to? And he pulls out his cell phone and he starts giving me all these names of other African-American pastors there in the Mississippi coastal area. So I, I then, from there, leave to go on to talk to another pastor. And I pull up. Somebody comes out and he greets me. It's the pastor. And he says, are you Brother Jamie? And I said, yes, I, I guess I am. Um, and he comes up and he gives me a big hug. And he says, Pastor so-and-so says you're all right. So you're all right by me, too. Now, for anybody here who may be on the Institutional Review Board, I do not make it a habit to hug my participants. But in this case, I, I thought it was okay. So I, I just share that story to say that, you know, it has impacted. And when we're helping in situations, I'm, I'm aware I have privilege. And I, I'm aware, too, that I have blind spots. And I'm aware that even when I was asking questions, that I'm sure there were, there were parts of the narrative that he held back because there was a power difference there. And that I had my biases in what I heard as well. But I think ultimately it comes down to building relationships. Um, so yes, relational. Like being re uh, relational is always going to be the key, right? Um, but it's just being aware of the privileges you hold, right? Uh, I'm not sure how, how familiar everyone is like with Peggy McIntosh stuff. White, she talks about the white privilege, but that's not just white privilege. I on it so. For the longest time, I was thinking, I'm, I'm Asian, I'm a woman, I'm just minority everywhere. I'm like, I, what privilege can I hold? <laughs> so much more than I could ever imagine, especially when I've been working, when you, when you are working with, um, especially in developing countries, and not even just that, when you're working with marginalized population, you realize it's not, it's not just being white or being a man, it's the education you hold, um, the, the environment you grew up, all of those plays, like, and just being able to know that and how that relates with the people that you are, t the people that you, you're trying to serve, is it, that's going to, I, I, that's the best you can do thus far. And from there you will learn, they, and if you approach it with humility, and I think that's, that's kind of the whole, um, our theme with, especially with HDI, it's humility. Um, when you approach that, then even when you do make a mistake, there is, there is forgiveness because you, you can tell when someone understands that you're trying in a place of heart. And so just understanding the privilege that you hold all, all across. Yeah, uh, first, just thanks for the question. I think it's an essential question. And uh, for me, as I mentioned in my talk about moving to Haiti and living with the family for seven months, and, and part of that was trying to go with humility and couldn't leave the privilege of my passport or being white, what doors that opens, and education and safety net. But it was a, an attempt you know, to, to go in as a learner. So I think I found that going in as a, as a humble learner 
is essential. And another piece I'd add, and you said, I think Jenny and Jamie covered a lot well, is my last book, Slow Kingdom Coming, I, I have these five practices for how to do this kind of work of justice. And the second practice is confession, which I think isn't talked a lot about in this work of justice. And, and one of the confessions is confessing privilege. But for me, it was only about one of eight confessions. And it's not a one-time confession. That this kind of work is a spiritual work as well, where I think we need constant confession of, of that privilege, which you mentioned of being white and male and these other privileges Jenny did. But there are all the kinds of other confessions we do. And so I think that that spiritual practice and posture is an essential part of doing this work well, too. Hi, thank you guys so much for coming and talking to us. I was wondering, you guys talked a lot about refugee crises. Often those come in tangent with political crisis, political um, dismantling. And you guys mentioned emergency management, homeland security, those kind of things. I'm wondering how your types of responses, what you're teaching in this program will intersect with political issues, maybe even post-war cleanup, post-war rebuilding. If, I mean, I know, um, I think of the Rohingya Muslim crisis right now, um, a disaster in every sense of the word, um, but highly politicized. Um, do the types of programs, the type of relief work you're talking about apply to those kind of situations? Do you incorporate political uh, marginalization, political conflict in your types of programs? Nobody wants to touch the now political microphone. Um, so I, I think that's a, a really great question because, um, and, and I think I would step back even even further than just politics, that the politics are part of a larger system, right? That, and the, the politics that we see and the things we see in the news is part of a broken system. Uh, so yes, those are definitely the sorts of issues that we're going to be talking about with our students and helping them see that the, the way governments are set up of how that can impact a, a community and how it can oftentimes set the stage for some of these pieces. You know, several of us talked about Haiti, for example, um, and, and I'm just thinking about with the example that uh, Jenny gave with, with the earthquake compared to like Italy. Well, we, when you live in a country where there's a lot of corruption, then people start cutting quarters and people are getting away with not building a decode and, um, or they're causing the conflict. Like for instance, we've done work in the Congo and looking at the civil unrest there. Or another example is we're doing research right now looking at the long-term effects of the civil war in Liberia and looking at forgiveness issues, including forgiveness with government, and how that is affecting people's responses. And then even in the US, we're looking at political issues. So right at the height of the refugee crisis and at the height of um, uh, the election process when refugees were being bounced around um, like for political gain at that time, we did a national survey of over a thousand people. And one of the things that we found that for many people, their political beliefs would sometimes even outweigh their religious beliefs, but not to sound like a broken record, that one of the biggest predictors was actually cultural humility of the individual. That those who were more open to learning about and accepting people from different cultures were more likely to view uh, refugees in a welcoming way, whereas uh, even people of faith who had more of an extrinsic belief, you know, that I'm doing this for my own gain, were more likely to see refugees as a, um, a national security threat. But again, also looking at political ideologies and those types of perceptions. I'll just add one tiny thing because I think it ties together the last these last two questions. I think it's really important to know the history of the places that we work, whether it's in the U.S. or in other countries. And I think knowing, you know, to go into an urban situation, not you know the history of redlining, you know, with African American housing and different things, or Haiti, what the conflicts are, these different things, um, means you can sort of be blind to your privilege or whatever exploitation played a role, and then you can kind of unwittingly play into different power struggles. So I think, um, I think your question's really good and that's an important part of what we'll address. Just wanna work with these people, just so you know. Um, they work at the Humanitarian Disaster Institute. I got a senior fellow. It's because I was writing an article for USA Today and you texted me and said, hey, if you'll be a senior fellow, will you put that on the, on the article? And I did. Let me say, though, I think these are important issues, important questions. Power dynamics are really important, particularly for someone who cares that we might be showing and sharing the love of Jesus in the midst of that brokenness. Uh, but let me just exhort, since I'm not answering any questions about the program, 
that even in the complexity of these things and the power differentials, I mean, my PhD is in missiology, so I'm always concerned about power differentials, socioeconomic differences, things of that sort. Remember that the complexity doesn't eliminate action. Is there are ways you can get engaged and involved now, and it'll be imperfect, and sometimes it'll be, it's not always, it's actually not always a big socioeconomic gap. Sometimes, I mean, 9-11 was the opposite. 9-11 was those most hard hit by the disaster were actually the affluent because of the fact that it hit the World Trade Center. But in the midst of all that, our role has to be to represent Christ. And when we do so, we ask, how might we do that in appropriate, ethical ways in the midst of the brokenness? The world's broken. This stuff's not going to end. Um, we may might even accelerate. But in the midst of that, don't 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 let the complain. I mean, this is why we have this degree, and these are some fine folks who are going to do a great job teaching the degree. Um, I don't think I'm even, I'm not teaching in your I'm sitting at your conference, but I'm teaching. I'm I'm kind of a motivational speaker who lives in a van down by the river. Um, so, but I would just say that that again, our station to you would be to get engaged and involved. The programs we want you to get involved in the program too. The MA is going to be great, but there are ways your churches and more can get involved even now. Um, I work for a national nonprofit a federated organization, and at the very founding of the organization, it, I believe it was very much seen as a Christian organization. But um, in the 20 years that I've kind of been out of uh, the for-profit arena, I've seen a shift where leading with faith seems to be um, unpopular to the point where even in this environment where everybody has come to do good, you can do good, but you can't do good in Jesus' name. Um, so can you just kind of speak to how do you do this work in an environment where you're called to the work and everyone here is called, literally called to the work, but um, doing it in Jesus' name might be seen as hostile. Perfect. Well, it's like you, you name humility as a core value, and it gets tough to it gets tough to grab the mic. Tomorrow we're talking about false humility. No, it's a fantastic question. I've, I've been in different organizations. I mean, I think it's such a big question. We could talk about that for, you know, kind of a whole session and evening about that. Um, I think a lot of organizations wrestle with that and see there, there are times where I think being guided by loving our neighbor. And what does that mean? And, and thinking about that com com like in a complex way. Um, and then it's about them, not about us. So as Ed said. So I think those are a couple of guiding principles for me. I haven't had a lot of, I've live in, I lived in Haiti and worked in Haiti and, and Haiti is so different. Like on that truck that I mentioned riding along and like people were probably at some point, if it wasn't for this nearby disaster would have been, uh, you know, talking about Jesus and if predestination was the way or not. And that's on public transportation. So um, I haven't been around that, but I, I think for us in the program, like this is a question we'll discuss. And I think, um, I think it's essential to embrace being Christian unapologetically and then also to respect our neighbors when they're vulnerable and recognize that sometimes in vulnerable spots, we want to not put it where there's like a pressure to receive Jesus to receive aid um, is one of the things we want to watch out for. Um, so I think thinking about all these themes of power dynamics, of being faithful, of wanting people to know Jesus, but then thinking about what are the dynamics in that situation, what need as we meet them in Matthew 25 of, of meeting Jesus, kind of trusting sometimes that the Holy Spirit moves um, just if we're meeting their urgent needs in a disaster. And there are going to be other times to share our faith more explicitly. So it didn't answer your whole question, but those are uh, a few of my first thoughts. Um, I think that's an exceedingly important question. And I think there's actually a new, relatively new book out, Peter Greer, Chris Horst, with Anna Haggard. It's called A Mission Drift, The Unspoken Crisis Facing Leaders, Charities, and Churches. The opening sentence is, without careful attention, faith-based organizations will inevitably drift from their founding mission. And I can, I mean, probably not helpful to name names, but it's one of the great crises of the last few decades is the, uh, the loss of a deeply rooted Christian commitment that sort of the, what remains is a desire to serve the hurting. And I thank God for that desire to serve the hurting. Um, 
to engage in different kinds of ministry, but I think I deep, I'm deeply concerned that we would be holistic, as someone talked about before. Um, and so for me, part of that means sharing the gospel in appropriate ways, and Kent is very, don't, don't, there's, no, there's no daylight between what Kent said and I'm about to say, is that, because you can't do that in, in, in ethically inappropriate ways. You can't do that and say, you know, if you'll become a Christian, we'll do this or that, or, but at the same time, if you don't do that, then ultimately the drift comes. And so I believe deeply that Jesus has sent us into a world that's both broken, so it's filled with disasters, and lost, so it needs to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I think both of those things deeply matter, done in an ethical way. And you've heard some questions about power dynamics. It's really, really important uh, because it really does impact things. And, for example, one of the things you'll find today is some governments are, uh, um, are particularly hostile because of past endeavors of religious organizations that were unethical in the way they dealt with disasters and poverty alleviation. So I think we can do both, but historically a lot of organizations are having a, ho a trouble holding that gospel part long term and, uh, and seeing the gospel as, um, you know, the, the very famous phrase that Francis of Assisi is, is uh, it's been a lot of people on Facebook or, you know, preach the gospel at all times, um, if necessary, use words. So two quick problems with it. Number one, he never said it, so there's that. Um, remember the words of Abraham Lincoln, don't believe all those quotes attributed to me on the internet. Uh, and secondly, it's really bad theology. I mean, I think ultimately, for us, we are both showing and sharing the love of Jesus in the midst of a broken world that needs service and a lost world that needs saving, and both of those matter deeply to me. And I think they matter deeply to Wheaton College, and I know they matter deeply to Jamie and the team there as well, in ethical, appropriate ways that acknowledge the power differential, the cultural differences, and more that are evident there. You know, uh, a conversation that uh, Kent and I had earlier today, and, and this it's actually come up in a couple other conversations throughout our afternoon uh, meeting some individuals, is that as Christians, we're called to do good, but we're also called to do good well. And, and by that, what I mean is that we also need to be thinking about how can we add value as Christians. Our help should be qualitatively different from others who are responding. And by that, I think we can see just even here in the U.S. with some of the recent disasters, if you just followed the news, that uh, there was so much more recognition for the role that faith-based organizations do play in times of disasters, where in the past they might have been viewed, if we're going to have a seat at the table, we need to actually downplay. But I think if we do our work well, we will have uh, more opportunities to serve in that way that you were describing. I, I also think that doing well means that we should also not shortcut the help that we do, that we need to be able to, to figure out what are those best practices. You know, I, I don't know how many times I've been in situations where um, I'm called in as like, the, like an evaluator to study, does something help? And when I ask them, how do, how do you know that this helps? What do all good evangelicals say? We know it in our heart, right? Which I think there's truth to that. I, I truly believe in the power of intuition as a way of knowing. But at the same time, God's also given us additional skills like science and, you know, learning relationally from other people. So we need to make sure that we're not shortcutting the work that we do. Okay. <laughs> do we have any other questions in the room? Oh, okay. Okay, you can come down. Great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this is really an art. I actually go to Trinity International, north of here, and um, no, because you guys were too expensive. <laughs> um, no, but I love wheat. My brother went here. Um, oh, well, it's okay. We'll welcome you anyway. <laughs> Uh, my question is, you talked about a lot about human trafficking. That's one of my deep passions and one of my convictions is how to like combat that. Um, what does your major kind of do with that? Like, What is in your major about that? Okay, walk with conviction. Give it to Jay. So one of the ways that our program is designed, we, we actually... It started several years ago. We went to the Accord Network uh, annual conference. So for those of you who don't know, Accord is a, a group of major Christian uh, international relief and development groups. And we met with a number of CEOs. We spent the whole day with them and managers and leaders within these organizations. And we're asking them, what does it take to do this work well? 
and um, also to deal with the complexities of different issues like trafficking. And, and what came out of it was a core, set of core competencies on what they really felt were the skills that those going into relief and development issues, including trafficking, need to have in general. So the way our program structured is that every student that goes through will gain the overall skills that they need, and then our goal is to help you match that to your passion so that you can take those skills and address that unique calling that God has given you. So throughout our courses, you know, we'll be highlighting issues of trafficking throughout the course work that we have. Uh, there's also a number of opportunities here in the greater Chicago area where we hope to be able to create opportunities for students to do volunteer work, to get engaged in um, an internship perhaps even. Uh, in the specific areas of interest to you. So if you kind of think about our training, that here's the overall generalist approach, and then our goal is to help you dig deep and to live out that calling that God's given to you. And I'm just adding on with that, the exactly. And then the one additional is at the very end, there's an internship. So you're being set up and giving you this framework that's generalist and then where you can keep diving deep along the way. And then your internship is obviously a place where you get to take all that you've learned in the program and apply it very much in, in that area. So we think that's a, kind of getting the both, best of both worlds of this overall framework and then being able to specialize as well. Well, you know, just one other piece to that is that I, we're also trying to create a number of uh, informal opportunities for students to also gain knowledge and develop uh, as practitioners in these contexts. That I think one of the things that has been so, in, that I've so enjoyed since we've uh, announced the program is just the number of Wheaton alum that have reached out to us who are working in so many different areas. So, you know, one of the things that I would be asking then is who are some of the Wheaton alum that we know that are working in that area and how do we make those connections with our students uh, to really be able to create those types of mentoring opportunities. Um, so thank you guys. I really enjoyed listening to all of you. So thank you for all that you shared. Um, some of the questions that I had is just in visualizing um, a disaster response situation, there's a lot of organizations coming in all at once, um, and also governments and just a lot of players. Um, and coming from a business background, one of my mentalities is competition. And obviously the last thing that you want, especially in talking about humility and um, working with locals and stuff is you don't want organizations competing with each other for accolades or power struggles between governments and faith organizations or other organizations. So um, I was just curious about your perspective on that, if that's something that you see as an issue or if not, how that can be combated. Um, it's a great question. I, I don't pretend like this is a, a total expertise in some of these areas where we don't have expertise. One of the strengths of the program, I think, will be bringing in people who you know, are working every day on these kind of issues. But I know for me, like in Port-au-Prince, I got down to Port-au-Prince six days after the earthquake, and, and it was great. There were so many people wanting to help, but you saw that sort of chaos. And in an urban environment, um, so there are different meetings and coordination. So there's a, a ton of coordination uh, informally where people are trying to talk with each other. I, I find that most people are, you know, feel people feel pressure to have the best stories and get stories to their donors, but there's also, you know, typically a, a good spirit in the places I've been. So I think that's one, one thing, even though there's competition, there's a good spirit and people want to coordinate. And there's so much to respond to that you can really, you try to divvy it out and share it. And then like when I was in Northern Albania, we would go weekly to a UN kind of cluster meetings where there's coordination. Most places with disasters have these kind of meetings where you're getting together, having cluster and okay, you're doing this and mattress in this sector and you're doing mattress distribution, you're doing food. So I think those kind of things you'd find on the ground and we would be, you know, in some of our classes, be addressing some of that uh, and setting up how you could think about that. Things that's surprising sometimes is actually things are pretty well organized. Who does what in within days, uh, and that's part of. It. I mean, Jamie actually was in D.C. Uh, received an award from the White House for some of their work. But there, there's these connections that are there. So, for example, I mentioned the North American Mission Board. I mean, we specifically are in charge of feeding people. So that's what, like, the job of the Baptist, because that's what you want the Baptists in charge of, is feeding people. It's a lot of chicken, uh, the gospel bird. Um, but so, so, that, so there is a very clear, and, and so it's the SUVs, the spontaneous unaffiliated volunteers that become the challenge. If you're in a system, if you're with Lutheran Relief Services, if you're doing, I mean, you pretty much have 
an assignment, and there'll be there'll be uh, a Ford operating base that people have these conversations from, and and, and more. So it's surprisingly uh, chaotically organized in a way that works because because people prepare ahead of time. You know, and one one of the things that our institute sometimes will be asked to do is to consult with different organizations or local churches that are very interested in how do we get involved in doing disaster work. And one of the things that we encourage them is to think about what is it that God's already uniquely called them to do and equipped them to do um, to be able to respond. So if your church um, is passionate about working with kids and you're doing great work with kids, if a disaster hits, start with helping kids. If your church has a great uh, serving gospel birds, um, like what Ed was talking about, then start by serving food, you know, what, whatever that is. And then if we all come together in that way, then we're responding as the full body of Christ. And I cannot think of anything more beautiful than that. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more question, if anyone has one. Hello. Um, so I've heard a lot of stories, and they um, sound like um, short-term solutions. So say you're helping someone escape from sex slavery, what are you then putting her or him in a position to do so that they're not just sliding back towards that lifestyle? Because helping someone for a short period of time, it makes you feel good, it's cute, then you go home. What about the people who are still there? I think we've mentioned it uh, several times that that's the whole point of working with the local community and working with the resources that are there. So, for instance, um, for, so for instance, IJM when they first started out, uh, they were known for their brothel raids. Uh, they would go in and say, hey, rescue all these girls, and they're like, ah, we did our job. This is great. And then what happens? They go right back into working in these brothels because, well, they've been drugged, and so they're addicted now. Um, they have no other, they're also uh, exiled from their communities, and they have um, no resources, essentially. And so they go back to the system. Uh, and then eventually they realize that they needed to work with the local communities. They needed to work with the police departments there. They needed to work with the, the hospitals, the, the mental health system that's there, that's going to be there. And so in terms of, you gave a very specific example of sex slavery. Well, the, the organizations I've seen most successful in terms of com combating and fighting or uh, for human trafficking or sex, sex trafficking specifically is the ones that are going to be there. They're, they're, the, they're the local community, the, the people that care within that community about trafficking that's going to make an effort and make, it's going to stay there because it's a very complicated issue, but beyond um, just of trafficking, it's a psychological, it's, a, it's, it's all of that. And so you need support. And so it's, uh, if we are working with along those lines, then, then it's our job, if we want to be coming in, making sure that the resources are there and they will stay there. You know, Ed, you, you mentioned earlier about um, the story that, or the uh, article that you wrote and highlighting the Good Samaritan. When we, if we look closer at that story of the Good Samaritan, the Good Samaritan didn't just respond uh, to the immediate needs. The Good Samaritan came back and, and gave the innkeeper money to help take care of the person in need. And, and I think that's a good model for us as well that, you know, you're, you're right, right on target. That oftentimes when we see a disaster, we help and then we forget about the long-term needs. You know, in fact, uh, just a few months ago, I was consulting with a major Christian denomination who, for the first time, are starting to consider starting a disaster response ministry. And they were asking, how can we be of the most help? Where can we plug in? And I told them, don't do an immediate response. Where most of the, the um, gap occurs is in that long-term response. I was like, I realize there's that push to want to do the media, and we still should. So in the ideal world, we'll, we'll help immediately and help again, right? And um, I, I think especially with issues of trafficking, it, it's also not just meeting that initial need, but it is getting into some of those systems about what made that person vulnerable in the first place. And that means kind of even going back to the, what I was saying earlier, 
that we can't just respond. We've got to tackle these larger injustices uh, that are putting people in these vulnerable positions. And I, th I think a lot of people would say yes to that and are gauging in that. Uh, I mentioned the Moody Church folks here. We have not far from here, kind of a place we don't specifically share, but it's called Naomi's House. My wife volunteers there. It's uh, helping uh, women coming out of the sex industry. Um, and it's a you know, transitional community. And, and so I, I do think people, you know, Christine Kane is a, actually a student in our grad school now. Uh, she leads A21 and uh, works with us in, uh, uh, you know, kind of promoting some of these, engaging some of these issues as well uh, with Propel and A21. So in their case too, they have typically have partnerships. Now sometimes you mentioned IGM, International Justice Mission, is, uh, was known for this and then sort of has, has uh, broadened their approach. But there are some people who are coming in specifically for a disaster. Uh, there may be people who take two weeks off and go do disaster relief, and I thank God for them. But the desire is for many, and I even mentioned my own denomination, it's a lot of relationships are created that to this day now involve economic development and engagement in New Orleans with now churches that would have never communicated with one another, but now a partnership from Alabama to there. So I really think there, there, there can be and is uh, an intentional long term, not just a disaster and done, but a disaster that, uh, that then leads to ongoing relationships and help long term. So agreed, and some there, we got some ways to go on the issue, but, but good, good progress, I think, for a lot of Christian uh, organizations. Well, thanks. We, we just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. We're, we'll, uh, we'll be staying around and happy to keep, keep talking late into the night. Um, and, but want to thank you and just wanted to end with telling you a little bit, I think we've covered most of it, but with the uh, MA in uh, disaster and humanitarian leadership, just want to mention a few things. One is that there are three different ways that you can do this master's degree. One is through an accelerated program if you're a, a Wheaton undergrad that you can start taking some of the courses early, which will help you get through at a different tuition rate. It will save you some money and also free up some of your time during the year of the program to do other kind of internships and specializing that some people would were asking about. So that accelerated program, you can start say, taking some classes in the MA program while you're still an undergrad and can be a really nice option. Uh, second is an on-campus version. So to come and be here for one year on campus with us, one year and then end with an internship, either locally or within the country or internationally. And then the third option is to do a two-year hybrid program where over the course of two years, you'll spend four weeks on campus, you know, two weeks at the beginning, one week the first summer, one week capstone at the end. And uh, besides those four weeks, the rest of it will be done online. So I wanted to share with you those Options also the graduate school application deadline is March 1st and so um, I want to encourage you to go and to ask us any questions you have the admissions um, Staff is fantastic and we'll be out at a booth afterwards both from the admissions team and and us So we'd love to talk with you about that and then I think the the last part is you'll see two different forms uh, in front of you as well as a pen and Encourage you to fill these out uh, for everybody if you could fill out this one holding it upside down, um, that ha if you'd like to join the HDI email list, we have all kinds of resources coming out regularly, and we'd love to get you on that list so you just know about the, the program and know about local resources and events and conferences. We'd love to stay connected with you in that way. And if you turn this in tonight, we'll give you a free copy of one of my books, which I actually wrote on this theme of disasters called Aftershock, Searching for Honest Faith When Your World is Shaken. So I wrote it uh, about my experience in Haiti after the earthquake. So we're happy as HDI to give you that gift if you turn in this uh, form to join the HDI newsletter. And then the second is if you'd like to receive information and you're interested in the graduate program, the MA program, fill out this card. Um, and if you fill that out and turn it in tonight, we'll send you an email with a discount code so you can get a free application. So you don't have to pay the $30 application fee. We'd love to give you, the, give you that for free, and thank you for coming out on such a cold night. And so if, you, if anyone who's interested, fill those two out, turn them in as you walk out the door or at the booth that's just outside the door. We'd love to have conversation and, um, and give you a couple of gifts that go along with those. So uh, thank you again for coming, and just let me, if you don't mind, I'd love to say a benediction for us in closing. This is the, the last page of my most recent book, and I adapted this from um, a benediction that most of you would know from the book of Numbers and adapted this thinking about blessing for people like you who care about 
those who are vulnerable going through disasters. Uh, so if you want to just sit there or close your eyes, but may you receive this as a, as a benediction and blessing as we finish our time tonight. May God bless you so you may deeply know that blessing and bless others. May God keep you so as you know God's embrace, you then reach out to embrace others. May God's face shine upon you so you may experience with others the warm light of creating together with God. May God be gracious to you so our practices of justice don't feel like rules but like freedom and joy. May God's face turn toward you so you know you aren't left to do this alone. And may God give you peace. So step by step, we practice moving together toward God's kingdom coming. Amen.